everybody, welcome back. I'm joined today with Carolyn Pleasance. She's a clinical psychologist out of San Diego. She's got a private practice there that she does both online and in person. And her specialty is to work with individuals and families. She also runs programs with groups, right, for mental illness mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And our topic today is the impact of social distancing and how it's impacted our relationships. So first, I want to say thank you so much for coming and for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us today. And just tell me, this is a starting spot. What is it that you've noticed? Like what's one of the biggest things that you notice as a consistent theme coming in from your from your clients about how they've shifted their relationships or what's happened after social distancing? Sure. Well, it's a Dawn, it has been so broad. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, I was meeting with somebody last week and she said something that I was like, Yep, yeah, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. She said she's starting to go back to work into the office only two days a week has been remote, right? Almost two, two years. Mm -hmm. And she said, Carlin, I don't, I don't know how I did this every day. I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, I, how did I sit, how did I like be around people and interact with people all day? Because I go in two days a week now and I come home, I'm so tired. Mm -hmm. I'm exhausted. I just, it feels um, so much more difficult to keep up where in the past it felt like it was a breeze it was just nothing and I think that um, sums up so many things that I've heard from folks over the duration is the sense of the it used to be easy or easy-ish and fluid and not something I thought a lot about but now I go whether it's work or a social event or my friend's house there's the sense of like I feel awkward and I kind of don't know what to say and insecure and what are people thinking you know all these things that maybe they were there before but weren't as heightened as mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. it's interesting to use the word awkward because that's that's what i keep hearing people say it's like we're so awkward at the grocery yeah. store we're so awkward at the like it's like we don't know how to connect so it's interesting that this is coming through um yeah. so clearly in all of your all of your patients yeah. as well what um so with people that are already in relationship, are they having a, a, an easier time with it because they're around somebody else all the time? Or what are they talking about and, and noticing within those relationships? Well, it's funny because you would maybe think that, but mm -hmm. most what I've kind of heard from people is it's actually harder, mm -hmm. like being at home with my partner all day. Now we might be in two separate rooms doing our own you know, jobs or whatever, but um, it's a little bit more tough to navigate. And I've heard people talk about, I didn't realize before, but when we're apart all day working or, or not together, then when we come home and, you know, the afternoon or the weekend, it, it's like nice and we get to engage and it's, right. oh, hey, I've missed you. Something about that shifted when I see you all the time. Mm. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I think the other impact that I've heard a lot about is the um, loss of the social connectivity. So partners who maybe had a very active social life, or maybe it wasn't even that active, but, you know, would go out with friends regularly, go out for dinner, meet for a movie. When that stopped or, you know, stopped for a really long time, there was this isolation effect mm -hmm. of... Um, Missing the contact, and then I think, like from a clinical perspective, we know that having good relationships is a buffer to a lot of things, right? Like depression or mood issues or a sense of loneliness and isolation. It really protects, it's a protective factor. Mm -hmm. So, whether it was individuals or couples, this loss um, of contact and the um, mood, like the shifts in mood. Mm -hmm. that happened like kind of across the board it was pretty amazing yeah I know I had heard people joke around you know and there's memes about this all over the internet like social distancing like extroverts all sad and introverts all like yay yeah yeah do you did you see that as true or is that something or do you feel like introverts quote unquote suffered as much as some of the extroverts um you know I did I think I saw both 
you know, the, the people that were more extroverted were just like, oh my gosh, this is killing me. Like, I, I don't even know what to do with myself. I miss people. Introverts, I think, did a little bit more like, well, this isn't so bad. You know, like, I, I don't mind being at home more. Um, but I, I saw more mood things because introvert. I, I mean, I'm just talking about some of the folks that are coming to my mind right now from my practice. The introverted ones tend to be a little bit more prone to depression, a little bit more prone to um, isolation. So it wasn't necessarily helpful to like not have to get up and put your clothes on and go to work and interact for those who leaned a little bit more towards the isolative type depression. So they would say, honestly, I get to wear my slippers all day and I don't really have to interact with anybody if I don't want to and it's so nice. But then you would see the moods mm. starting to, to go down because they're like, well, I don't, I don't really have to get out of bed until like 10 where before I would have to get up and shower and get out the door by eight. And so there were just these elements that on one hand, some folks would say, oh, I, don't, I don't mind this too, bad, too much. I kind of like it. But then there would be this um, almost like consequence to it and the woman I mentioned in the beginning who said how did I do this all day she was one of those okay. where she started, and during the middle she's like I kind of like this working at home thing I don't know if I'm even going to want to go back right but she had a lot of depression during during that time because she just wasn't you know like face to face with hardly anybody this isn't the same mm -hmm. um, as being like literally in the room with somebody Oh, yeah. So are there things that you're recommending to your patients overall or like ways to resource and kind of break out of that awkwardness mm -hmm. and start reconnecting in a, because like my perspective, and I don't even know if this is true, this is just, but I think some people are also afraid to connect because mm -hmm. of the polarization. Like, oh, if I say the wrong thing about vaccinations yeah. or about politics, I'm going to get attacked. So now I'm oh there's also a fear level. Is that Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to mention that, that um, some of the, the when people are like, it's so awkward and it's a little weird and I'm a little afraid and I don't know what to say. What do people think? I'm you know, All these things. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with this sense of, am I being judged? Are some people thinking negative of me? Like if I, if I wear my mask or not wear my mask, what are people going to make of that? And, and the, even the physical, um, gosh, I mean, you've probably seen this right in your practice. Like, the hugs aren't as huggy anymore. And the, the, the notion of, you know, embracing somebody or shaking their hands, all of a sudden there's just like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Ooh. You know, it's a little bit more tentative and awkward. Yeah. So then it stirs. And I, I will say, I, I absolutely have experienced this myself. Like, can I, should I, hug? can I hug? Should I ask first? What should I do? What if it's weird? What if they actually, what if they hug me, but they really didn't want to? Like these were things that were not, I think so prominent in people's experiences before the pandemic and all of the social distancing. So the the fear of um, I mean, I like I don't want to upset somebody. If somebody if I'm walking by somebody in the grocery store and they flinch and move away, like I really need to know that that's not personal. But it's we're you know we're exposed to that, mm -hmm. and so I think um, to your question of you know, advice or what I've been supporting my patients in doing is one, when it comes to the effects of like not having to get up and get out of the house and get dressed and do your normal things is to do that anyway. Even if you end up not leaving the house because you're working from home, like get up, have your breakfast, take your shower, put your makeup on, like whatever the things are, go outside for a walk and maintain, reestablish and maintain your routine even if you aren't going into an office, for sure. Um, and I think, you know, people, um, I think have kind of figured out how to navigate still having some social contact um, outside, you know, outside instead of in somebody's house or at a park or open air spaces where before, I, it's not like that stuff wasn't available, but I don't think we thought about it in the same way. Um, so, you know, lots of encouraging people to still get out there. Yes, I know it's different and it's not the same, but it's better mm -hmm. than, than being at home and missing, like missing your friends or, or missing the contact. Right. Yeah. It, and 
well, people are like, I feel so awkward. I feel, I'm like, and so does everybody else. Yeah. So that's one of the things I try. I'm like, I get it. Yep. And I think you, you, like lots of people are in this boat ro- right now. So you might feel awkward and the other people in the room probably feel a little awkward too. So you're certainly not alone. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's, and that's a great reminder, right? Because I think we all do that. We look at ourselves and like how we feel and be like, well, they're all confident and they're all okay and they're all, but I'm not, you know, this, yeah. yeah, because we are, are holding that image for each other as well, right? As we sure. are maybe seen as confident or brave or whatever it is that we're yeah. doing. Yeah, so much projection of that, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I know one of the things I've tried to implement with people is like, hey, are you handshaking? Are you hugging? You know, like trying to ask, but there's still times where that feels awkward or it feels like, mm-hmm not the right time or, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Totally. Well, and I think the fear of judgment, right. Of like, why are, why are you asking? Or if I, if, are, if I'm comfortable hugging, but they're not comfortable hugging, are they thinking I'm irresponsible? You know, these things that, um, again, I weren't really there before or weren't really there in the, in the way that they are now. Uh, um, like have you traveled lately like in the past that would be like oh have you traveled lately where'd you go yeah now it's like oh have you traveled lately are you quarantining when you got home right <laughs> like, there's like some subtext in there that just wasn't there before and I, again I've, I've experienced this too where you get asked a question or I go to ask a question then I'm like Ooh, yeah I don't know I don't know about this what are they really saying or what am I really asking yeah. Um, so a more ca- cautiousness, I think that's part of the, that sense of awkwardness is kind of eggshells and tiptoe and a little bit, you know, worried that somehow I'm going to offend somebody or, um, you know, get in their space or whatever. Yeah. And do you have any, any advice to kind of overcome that? Like any, you know, like we can say like, oh, it's just not about you. Just remember, it's not about you, right? But that's so easy, so much easier said than done, like, right? Yeah. That other people's stuff, yeah. their own stuff. So do you have any other, uh, any like suggestions that you might be able to share about how people can resource themselves when something mm-hmm. does happen, when something does go a little askew or someone misunderstands a question or mm-hmm. does judge? Well, and you know, it's, I would say it's the same advice that I was giving long before this. Mm-hmm. And it's easier said than done, as is almost always the case. But it's about, I, I think it's about that really authentic, um, like genuineness in the moment. So if you feel um, like so, someone's been judgmental or something like that, like what I ask patients, like, well, what would it be like to say that? Or to say like, oh, I feel like you might be judging me a little bit right now, or are you judging versus swallowing it and then going and nursing your resentment later, mm. right? Um, which then shows up on maybe, or shows up as maybe avoiding that person next time. Right. Or if, you know, you've, whatever, like said something or asked a question and the other person felt a little, you know, stung or caught up the golf cart, ask that, oh, I, I'm sorry, like, did I hurt your feelings or whatever? But, but this idea of not holding back mm-hmm. your experience, um, cause we, all, you know, we know the world of trouble that we can get into when we're doing that. Um, but being able to just ask questions or say your piece, you know, really respectfully, you know, respectfully, not, not judgy, not angrily, which takes practice. Um, but pre and post pandemic. So yeah. Yeah. No, I like that, Carlin. I hadn't actually thought about it that way. It's actually asking, right? Yeah. Like so, a little reality check, like, I'm sorry, like did whatever. Like, did that did I hurt your feelings? Or oh gosh, was that too personal of a question? I wasn't was my intention. What whatever. Mm-hmm. But asking, because I mean we see it, right? I mean, not everyone will notice, but we see it. The, per- the person's little the face go- does a little something or an eyebrow twitch or something that right that's like, oh, I think I might have just stepped on a toe. Right. Um, or the hesitation of like, uh, well, then do you- yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> I answer that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, just uh, the ongoing work of practicing and um embodying like authentic 
authentic living and being true to yourself and the idea, I mean, that's what I kind of believe and preach and try and practice is that when we're coming from a place of um, authenticity and like genuineness and we're delivering that kindly, um, we, we don't, we can't go wrong by ourselves, right? There's like no wrong way. Now, if we're not delivering that kindly or we're delivering it with sharp edges, you know, there's going to be some ruffled feathers, of course. Um, but when we're true to ourselves and we're delivering it um, compassionately and with respect to the other person, it's really hard to go wrong. I mean, we can't, um, you know, there's no guarantee they're going to be able to take it in and receive, but like you're, you know, you're doing your part. Yeah. yeah, which is great too, like, because then it leaves less room for regret or the stories we tell ourselves, yeah. right? Like, yeah, maybe I should have said this, maybe I should have done that, maybe I should have done that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I love that. And I love those words that you use, the authenticity, genuineness, compassion, respect. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's being true to yourself, right? Kind of regardless of your opinions or beliefs or your values or whatever, like, honoring those mm -hmm. and also honoring the other person that you're having a conversation with. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we, there's, we don't know how it, it, it may not always go well. I mean, people can receive or not, or mm -hmm. if they can, I mean, that to me would be like the ideal situation is we have say two different opinions or we have really different perspectives on something, but we can come together each um, kind of anchored in our own truth and have conversations respectfully with one another that don't dissolve into that, you know, arguing thing that is easy to have, especially nowadays. So. Yeah, yeah. I feel like sometimes we're putting our identity as our belief system, right? And mm -hmm. then it becomes more personal. If like sure. my identity is my belief, that's a really different story than like, this is my belief and I'm curious what your belief is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Hard to identify sometimes in oneself <laughs> until right. you're in the middle of it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I love it. Um, anything else that you've noticed um, or that has been, have been helpful for clients? I know you said like to go out to like practice and when you're not, if you're not going out, still get ready in the morning and things like mm -hmm. that. What are other ways that people can practice when they are out to start moving through that social awkwardness or maybe even buffer some of the isolation, even if they're not engaging with a lot of people. Sure, sure. I mean, I think it's, I, I find myself, um, when I am giving suggestions or advice, it, it feels like the kind of things I would suggest for somebody who has like social anxiety. Mm. So again, like pre-pandemic, already a pre-existing social anxiousness of, going out there and practicing. And, um, in, you know, in today's culture, it's a little bit weird to say one of, one of the more um, important things you could do is expo it's exposure, right? Because now that's become a word that's very scary to people. Um, but exposure to the things that you're feeling afraid of. So if you're feeling afraid of going down to the shopping center to get a coffee, like, well, go get a coffee and don't just get a coffee and come home, go find a table outside and sit there even if you're by yourself, because just being exposed to a, um, a social environment, even if you're not yet interacting a lot within it, over time is going to help reduce some of that anxiety. I mean, avoidance um, in some ways feels really good when we've escaped something that feels scary, but it's actually the very worst thing we can do, right? Because avoidance creates more avoidance. It's, it's positively reinforcing. So it's like getting out there anyway. And even if you just go sit on a bit, lots of places nowadays have opened up, right? Little tables and benches and sitting areas. Um, even if you're not ready to have lots of one-on-one -on -one face to face interaction with people, just go sit, read a book, whatever. Um, Cause that exposure is going to help hopefully um, support people in returning back to pre-distancing um, confidence. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I love that. Yeah, sometimes I wonder what's hap what will happen with the children who are like, oh never learn the social skills at quote unquote the age they normally would, right? And now yeah. it's a whole interesting brain adaption. 
And, you know, I, I was referred a, um, gosh, I think she just turned 12 or 13. I started seeing her during the pandemic because the first year she was home, homeschooled mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, at home. And then she was going better. The school had opened up for this last year. And I think what happened, she was already a little introverted before, but pretty much developed a social phobia. And I think in in spending a few months with her, helping her, you know, get ready and navigate going to school for the first time and whatnot, is I think she missed a critical developmental period. Mm. Like during the time that she was, I mean, everyone for like at least that first year, right, was pretty much at home. She was right on that 12, 13 year old path where lots of really important social things are happening, like at school and with your friends and with your sports. And it was nothing. So I think she got, um, it's almost like it delayed her. Mm. So here she is, 13 plus, getting ready to go. I don't know. I think it was eighth grade. I'm not sure. And was like young, you know. And and so part of the process was helping her catch up a little bit. But I do wonder about the younger kids or the ones that were isolated or at home for longer periods of time. Um, this young lady had um, like a younger brother and two older siblings. Like she had some people to interact with. But, you know, if she was an only child, that might have gone very differently. So, yeah, helping people catch up if they missed a little bit of the developmental trajectory of that, of the kind of socializing, socializing comfort. Great. Well, I love I love what you do and thank you for, oh. for everything. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. And I love, thank you for also talking about so many different layers, right? Because I think it is easy for us to forget, like, this is actually impacting everybody, even if we're not hyper aware of it, mm-hmm. you know? Absolutely. And, and I guess maybe there's some, I mean, my hope is that you, a, a person can take a little bit of comfort in that. Like, I'm not the only one that's out there worried and like all of a sudden insecure when I wasn't before or mm-hmm. worried about being Jenna. Like, I mean, everyone's swimming in that a little bit right now. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, can acknowledge that. Right. No. Me, like, I go to the grocery store and I'm like, hey, and people are like, uh, hi. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. sorry. Like, should I be sorry? I should be like, I'm training you. <laughs> <laughs> This is exposure therapy. Exposure therapy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. Anything else? Any last minute like comments you want to make? Anyway. You know, I think, um, well, kind of like I said, like we're all in the same boat, right? So some people, have, you know, everyone's had their own experience and some people were maybe more challenging than others or folks that like like lost their job, didn't even have a job to do remotely. Like, you know, everyone has their own unique uh, experiences with the pandemic and all that that did, you know, in our society, but there's still a level of like, we're all in the same boat, right? So if we can just be mindful of that, it might reduce some of our own awkwardness and anxiety, but also give a kind of a platform or a foundation of having these conversations with folks. Yeah. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Carlin. um, Anything else you want to say is if people want to connect with you, I can just drop something in the chat or. Sure. I mean, my, um, my website is carlinpleasance.com and there's, you know, people can email through that site and more than happy to to talk to folks. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Yeah. Well, thank you, Don.